Charlie Van here back at Steam Theory Brewing Company in Dallas, Texas. On this episode, I sit down with Dallas musician Derek Tussing. Derek, thank you for taking your time. How are you, man? Um, absolutely glad to be here. Uh, I'm doing well, dude. Doing well. We're enjoying some nice, tasty Saturday beverages. Uh, mm-hmm. What do you got going on there? What do you? What do you? I wish I could remember the name. Oh. The juice. Goose the oh, juice. Oh yes, yes. Well, uh, we juice caboose. Juice. But well, we got it right here. If you need cheat sheets, yeah, yeah. we got cheat sheets right here. So, juice caboose. That is a hazy IPA. I'm hanging Solid. with an old faithful. This is Brew Bohemians. It's a Czech coaster. So you know, nice and light. You know, it's yeah. only what twelve thirty right now. <laughs> <laughs> I tried the uh, their hef. And then I was convinced after another taste by the bartender to roll with this the hazy. one, which he was right. Are he you being hophead? Do you like a lot of um, IPAs? When it came, like when craft brewing first started to appear in Dallas, and I was at the time serving craft beer, IPAs is what like really like triggered my enjoyment of them because I hadn't really had very many before that. It wasn't a style I was familiar with. Um, but I've since relaxed quite a bit on if I'm going to go hop forward on stuff. I like it, but I've actually found a lot more character in beers that don't initially have that, like, punch. You know, uh, I like a lot of hefts. I like, um, pilsners are good, too. So I started to drift back to wider styles and just, like, appreciating the like more relaxed nuances of some you know more classic to the style stuff i mean texas and like north texas dallas area was going heavy on the yeah. hops there which they're good but i don't ever i don't know i also don't drink a ton of beer anymore i kind of turned really? to, to drink drinking wine and stuff like that but a little fancy you know not the wine I drink. Yeah. <laughs> Is it the, the, the box wine? I don't drink box wine, yeah. but I go to like Kroger and like Albertsons and I'm on the bottom shelf. Oh, the like, Barefoot. Is it Barefoot? <laughs> Is that what that is? I'm, I'm, uh, I mean, that's one of them. But let's not, let's not give away my cheap, cheap yeah, wine yeah, I'm here on the show. <laughs> I want to keep this classy. I yeah. shouldn't have even mentioned it. <laughs> Never know. We get a, yeah, yeah. get a sponsor for that wine. Uh, uh, all right. Well, uh, I mean, as a musician, when you're at a show, like, do you go for beer or you go for like a spirit like or do you not Hmm. drink at all until after yeah uh so initially once i finally became 21 because i was in bands far before that and most venues will give you drink tickets and such uh as a part of your payment since they're not going to pay you anything no uh (laughs) but uh Once I turned 21, yes, I would always drink before shows, and I thought it kind of helped me, but I actually like the connection of being sober for your audience. Yeah. I don't find that I express myself better, Um, and I like the memory of the event without any sort of haze across it. So, I mean, I used to be a big pot smoker, and, uh, and I... I still don't enjoy weed, but it's not something I do publicly anymore. It's kind of the same thing with drinking is uh, I want to present myself in a way that I can connect with whoever's there or even connect with myself. Um, And so, yeah, I don't really go for a drink anymore uh, immediately. I might after the fact, but yeah, I want the performance to stay as like grounded as I can be. Well, you mentioned bands from high school. What was the band name? Huh. Oh, well, you know, we were talking before the podcast about um, trying to find a band name that's, like, not taken yeah. or, like, represents. So that band in high school, we went through, like, five or six different iterations of the name. Uh, the one, I think, that we released the most content under was Frontline. Frontline. Which is weird. Uh because I feel like with that title of name, you should be like a hard like punk band. Yeah. Or like have some political like. Have the vest going. Yeah. Or... But that band, yeah, Frontline, uh, which is a cool band. I appreciate being in that band. 
I think I was in the band with some talented people. I got spoiled on having an incredible drummer. Yeah. Which I've been fortunate to have in other yeah. projects too, but uh, yeah. Especially for a high school. Band. Oh, yeah. So, what, what was the genre or style? I mean, is the easiest thing to reference it to is like a pop punk yeah. kind of style. Uh, and then <laughs> at the time, like Screamo and stuff was really big. Oh. So, we would occasionally get slightly heavier. I remember like screaming my voice out at like <laughs> practices and shows. Uh, but yeah, uh, probably pop punk. So you graduated because you're from Dallas, Saxy. Yeah, yeah. When did you graduate? I graduated in the class of 2007, but, okay. I, but I left high school in 2006. Like okay, so we're about the year. same. Yeah, yeah. So when you're mentioning those bands, I remember Scary Kids, Scary Kids. Huh. I saw them live yeah, I saw them. at the original door location oh, yeah. many years ago. Man, yeah, I yeah. missed the door. It's gone now. Yeah, I mean, elbow to elbow, battle the bands back then. I mean, dude, that was a venue uh, that... Even in what, 15 years ago when Deep Ellum was fairly rough. Uh, oh, yeah. And I mean, even before that, but yeah. still, uh, I remember I wouldn't even tell my parents I was going to a show down there yeah. just because, like, I'm like, yeah, you don't need that information. I remember I had friends, they're like, we're playing, you know, down in Deep Ellum. Like, what time? Well, it'll be close to 10. Like, can you film it? Like, yeah. I mean, it, it has seen its, like, roller coaster. And, well, let's talk a little bit about that because, you know, as you mentioned, you know, Dallas music scene is it's kind of has been like a roller coaster ride as far as not just genre but the appeal of, of deep bomb. Where do you see it now uh, compared to like you mentioned like fifteen or even ten years ago, especially from a musician's point of view? Um. Well, I gotta be honest. My uh, active participation in like specifically like Dallas venues. And like deep element menus is not of like I don't spend a whole lot of time in that environment, um, but I think right now you're gonna have to try hard to get me to deep element, and that's not because there's not a lot of good venues down there. But I feel like it's oversaturated with food and bars and like. Uh, a culture that is like not really where I want to be. And that's not to say anything ill of what's going on. Down it's just there. more nightlife, nightclub. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's not my kind of vibe. I think there's great venues down there. I was just recently at uh, Dada for a really great show. And I love Three Links. Yeah. I love some stages down there for sure. Uh, but I don't see a super handful of the artists that I'm going to go watch playing like off Elm or off uh, Main Street that much. Uh, but yeah, I see, I guess uh, I'm interested in stuff going on Oak Cliff, uh, the Kessler, yeah, um, stuff like that. But, and I mean, you even have with the Granada Sundown at the Granada, especially for totally. a singer, a songwriter. So, there are places, you know, I just think forever, for those that are tuning in that maybe not been in this part of Dallas, I mean, Deep Ellum is kind of like our 6th Street, or has been, but, you know, Current Club, unfortunately, last summer closed, and that was such an iconic venue, especially for bands trying to artists get their start, or even, I mean, some big acts went through there, and then we mentioned The Door was another place, so... When you go down to Deep Elm, there is music, like you said, Three Links, but there is that more nightclub, something you kind yeah. of compare it to like a Miami a little bit. You see more cover artists, yeah. and I hear more, like if I'm yeah. walking the streets of Deep Elm, that's what I'm going to be hearing, is someone playing some country or like acoustic covers of you know popular songs, and there's a place for that, but that's not like, that's not going to pique my interest. Yeah. Well, speaking of cover, you, you've covered a couple of songs from Pedro the Lion. What do you think yeah, is, sure. uh, what do you think, who has a cover that is as good as the original or better? Ooh, that's an interesting question. 
like a recorded cover? Yeah, or recorded. Something somebody that they like, like to like uh, play a lot. I recorded like, like an artist where you like I I like both or maybe the 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 new you know, artist is better. A better version. Uh, this is a one of my favorite covers because it took a song that I wasn't really attracted to yeah. and created something totally different. But uh, if you know uh, Andy Hole of Manchester Orchestra, yeah, I love Manchester. Have you heard his cover of Escape? Uh uh-uh. uh You know the song Escape? Yeah. So I always not dug that song because it's a very the melody of it and like the way it's presented yeah. is so I don't know. Yeah, fun. And- yeah, yeah, which is cool. I mean, it hooks people. But Andy Hole does this cover. It's like kind of slow electric palm muting, and you actually like feel what's happening in yeah. the song because until I had heard this cover I didn't even know what the song was about because I wouldn't really tune in when yeah. I was hearing it because I was just like oh it's that song but it actually tells like a much more interesting story and uh, that I think is an incredible cover it kind of makes uh, it its own oh know? yeah for sure there's uh, you could know Escape and if you weren't paying super attention, it will, you wouldn't even know yeah. it was the same song. Which is uh, which is good because you could love the original, but this is, is like his own, made it his own. Like we were talking about, a Star Is Born. Yeah, before yeah. we practically had a full podcast before we started <laughs> recording. Uh, you know, they're kind of similar directions, but a little bit their own style. But I mean, Manchester Orchestra, though. I mean, what a masterpiece they are. Uh, yeah, I mean, he does some great work. Um, and also, he's a great artist because you see he's got like his solo project, Right Away Great Captain, if you've heard that. And he's got Bad Books these days with Kevin Devine. So like, when I think of him as a songwriter, I just think he just never stops. You know what I mean? He, he doesn't turn it off. There's no moment where he's not like creatively involved in just whatever he wants to do. And that's impressive. I'm trying to think of another uh, artist. Um, Honestly, I liked Disturb. Uh, their version of Sound of Silence I thought was really daunting. His voice, like whether you're a fan of Disturb or not, that song. And I think maybe it was a little more powerful because I saw it. Uh, this is a bit Dancing with the Stars he did in the finale, and the yeah. the star that won is actually uh, Death. He was a model, and they that was where they kind of broke out that that song. Hmm. Ooh. And that made it really. Oh, yeah. I mean, they broke it out. I think on Conan, but I mean it's the fact that during that, yeah, too. and then after that, and his, I mean, his vocals are just so deep. And I love the original, obviously Simon and Garfunkel. But if you listen to this, they made it their own. It just, it just, yeah. it's powerful. I have heard it, and I was impressed by it. And one of the factors too, I think, is you get to hear his voice a little bit yeah. more gentle at yeah. times than Not you would on a Disturbed yeah. record. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's another thing too. If you can not only cover something and do it well, yeah. but then also present a little bit more of what you're capable of doing outside of your wheelhouse, uh, you know that we've heard, I think is a uh, really important factor. Um, but yeah, back to the my uh, Pedro the Lion covers. Uh, yeah, that's a series, a video series that I can t- intend on continuing called uh, Tustin Covers Bazan and uh, yeah uh, he's one of my top songwriters I don't know if you know of his work I'm not too familiar dude but now I, I will this, yeah. this is how I learn about music right here like I, I he influences me endlessly not just on his content yeah. but on like his drive and the way uh he just like really puts it out there and um, really speaks from his heart. He's not like trying to make music so that you'll attach to it, which I do, but like he's just trying to like often get over some stuff or like work through some thoughts and like that's what's powerful to me is like music as medicine not only for your audience but for you like a way to work through it all and like be there and present in unashamedly deal with your interior world but have, have, have you tagged him in anything where he's kind of like liked or 
the cover? I haven't. Um, it's interesting you ask that. Uh, I did give him one of my uh, EPs yeah. years ago. So he does these house show tours. Uh, when he broke out of Pedro the Lion, the band, and became solo for quite a while, he would play living room, a whole tour, like hundreds of shows in a year, in people's living rooms. And I went and saw him, and I handed him a copy yeah. of, at the time, self-produced, self-released, uh, like five songs. And I was just thinking the other day about tagging him I mean, like, yo, do you ever listen to that? Like, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Um, I did the same with one of his good friends, Damien Girado, which is another great songwriter, where I gave him a record uh, of mine the last time he was in town. And my uh, dream is to one day be in the same room with both of them and be like, <laughs> did you guys hear the... Yeah, or, it's like, did you... <laughs> or just like yeah. I don't know, maybe some random day they're on a podcast or whatever. Because they bring and they mention yeah. it, like they happen to cross the line of like they mention Derek Tussing. They're like, wait, you got a record from that dude too? Because I don't know. That's just like, yeah. If that ever happened, uh, that would be making it for me. <laughs> so that would have been my next question. If there could be an artist right now that that you could pick to play with, whether it's one or two, man. To play with, like yeah. open for, yeah. Uh, yeah. So you know how people talk about five years ago. I wrote down I was gonna open for, or I was gonna play this venue or whatever, and they manifest that reality for themselves. Like I've been trying to think, what do I write down as my like personal artistic manifestations? Um, and both of those guys would be on the list for sure. Uh, but another band that they might be a, a little too big time for me at this point. I mean, they're, uh, but because of their backstory, uh -huh. I also think there's like this possibility of me falling into this scenario do you know the band Dr. Dog I don't think so uh, well, I have a whole list so I gotta yeah, yeah, like yeah. go after today they're a really sick rock and roll band and part of their story is uh, one of the members girlfriends giving a copy of one of their early records to a member of My Morning Jacket okay I know My Morning Jacket and then being yeah. invited on tour not long after now, do I think Dr. Dog, far beyond, has the talent to have made it outside of that moment in time? Hands down, for sure. Yeah. But the idea that that type of relationship can still happen, like you can get the music to the ear of another artist yeah. and then be compelled enough by what you made to be like, play with me like yeah that to me speaks to like the power of music because it's not always about numbers and it's not always about it's about the music at that point like it's about speaking to the person that gets it in their hands and like really takes time with it well that's kind of that is cool that there are artists out there that are willing to kind of pay it for you know because yeah, at dude. some point somebody might have done that for them um, and it's almost even if it isn't as direct, it's almost hands down. No one makes it anywhere without a community of some sort, yeah. I think. Uh, and yeah, that that's important to me. Have you have you made a lot of, I'm sure you have, probably have made a lot of good, close relationships through the music community here in Dallas just over the years just playing or? Um, I'm working on it. Yeah. Uh, so... <laughs> The last few years, like when I released my first uh, studio album, I was actually on the tail end of like a year of travel, and so I wasn't in the scene to really promote it in the way that I wanted. And I feel like at the time too, I was still dealing with like some lack of confidence or yeah. lack of like belonging but I think I've grown past that where I feel what, like what I'm doing is 
important. Yeah. Uh, not just to me, but like, I think my songs really speak to a lot of people. And now I'm not, I'm trying my best to not only like push myself to be out there, but also, yeah, support other artists, go to as many shows as I can, be at events that are, you know, Dallas centric and like really, uh, you know, put my efforts into being a part of what I think is a really great scene. I think there's a lot of really talented musicians out here. And, uh, I mean, going to shows adds so much value, I think, to my life. Like, live music is important to me. Uh, there's nothing really better than seeing the artist, especially if it's artist that knows how to express themselves in the live setting. Like, you can hear it on a record, and hopefully you do, but there's... Yeah, I feel like there's nothing like that live moment of it being created then and now. I think what's really cool is when you go to a show, say a known show, like a known artist, and you discover one of the openers who may be oh, local, totally. and you're like, how have I not heard of this band? <laughs> and then you're hooked. That happened with me with the band here. Um, they've broken up since then, but the Raven Charter, I like, I went to Non Point and Taproot at Trees, and they were one of the openers. And I like, I remember me and my buddy were like, "This is awesome! Like, how are they not on the radio?" And like, befriended yeah. the band, and you know, they in the area for a long time. But I think that's cool because there's so many little diamonds, you know, treasure. It really is. There's a treasure chest here in Dallas. Just not. And you could probably agree to this. Not a lot of people are just informed. You know, they know about the big acts, obviously. Yeah. Or they think, okay, indie, local, I gotta go to Austin. But Dallas, for a while, has had this scene. It's just people need to have that moment where they're drawn in. Well, yeah, they need to have that moment. And yeah, it often could happen in the live setting because of the just oversaturation of the internet. Uh, it's hard to get that moment with someone. And yeah, you could hear a band who's been playing for 10 years and be like, how the hell did I not hear this? Do you guys curse on this podcast? Oh, you could, you could yeah. I we're, to ask. We're, uh, this is the uh, PG. Uh, <laughs> could be, you know. Yeah. No, um, you, can, uh, you can say shit. You can say, you know. Cool, cool. Hell isn't even really crossing the line, yeah. in my opinion, but just so I know, you know, when I get amped here in a minute, just we're worried about those Darsh Danans and Darns and that, you know, that's, <laughs> Uh, we're trying to get picked up by PBS here, so oh. feel free. Just go all out. We got to get it out of the way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what were you saying right before that? So uh, I mean, just how like you oh, know this, you, you can this, discover yeah, people yeah discover that, not, that a lot um, of people don't know that that there is this scene here. There is a wealth of talent. Um, sometimes though, you have to go kind of catch a kind of more known artist to see it. But yeah. I mean. Here's another question for you as a singer songwriter. Uh, what's been some of the great venues that you felt like that you would recommend for people to go to to discover singer songwriters uh, like yourself? And uh, also, when did you make that choice? Like, okay, you know, even though you love being in the band, like I want to do my own thing. Um, I don't think I really made the choice so much as like the choice was necessary if I wanted to continue making art because being in a band is really difficult and uh, that takes a commitment from everyone involved and so not that the people I was working with weren't serious about it but they had just different directions in their lives and for me music has always been like the direction uh, and you know we had a friend get married we have this guy wanting to do this career choice or whatever and so people just grow to a different point in their lives and I've since had those same guys from my other bands on records with me but that's because I can get them for an afternoon to lay down some yeah. bass, you know what I mean? But I'm not going to get them on tour anytime yeah. in the next five years. Yeah. Uh, so 
yeah, it just came out of necessity. Like, I never stopped writing songs. And so I was like, well, I can make my own record. Yeah. Like, I have the content. I have the drive to do it. And I also think being in bands has made me good at being a solo artist yeah. because when I work with people in studio I'm looking for their input I'm looking for them to do their thing to play their instrument the way they want to play it whereas I think if I had started as a solo artist I'd be maybe a little bit more particular like oh I wrote you this guitar part or I wrote this for you to play. I don't really do that. So I still have that band mentality like when it comes to tracking. Like on this last album, we did it live and we did it with everyone's input, you know. I would be like, okay, you know what? We're gonna extend the end of this song or we're gonna do this intro different, whatever. And I work with people that are adaptable to that space, uh, but yeah, I guess I would say the decision made itself. Yeah. Just out of, I'm going to keep making music. I don't have a band to do it with. But I'm ultimately happy with being solo. It means that when I feel the song is complete, it is. There's no one to ask. Yeah. So, uh, I like that aspect of it. Going back to the band, like, you know, everyone kind of doing their own thing, going their own direction. Do you do you think this is a type of city where you're going to see that more compared to, like, if you go to Austin where there's a focus, you lived in California before, where entertainment, music, all that has more of a focus. So there's more, when I say a chance, it's like, okay, like, everyone is on that same thought process, like, if I could take this further. Compared to here in Dallas where a lot there's a lot of good talent, but a lot of people, this is like, they have their 9 to 5, and maybe yeah. this is this little bubble here is all that they see. I mean, you kind of see that more with Dallas? I see what you're getting at, and I've never really thought about it, but I would actually, as you're stating that question, I would totally see that as a truth. Um, This is a city that thrives and grows a little bit more on the career mentality, the work mentality, and... Um, say, you know, take Austin or California, I think a lot more people grow up with maybe parents or or members of their family that have been successful in the arts, so they see it as a more possible avenue, whereas Dallas, um, yeah, I think there's less of that. Um, and that's because maybe, you know, the artist's lifestyle gravitates to different, I don't think markets is the right word, but different areas. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I would say that's probably pretty accurate to the scenario that we're in. Uh, but I don't know. There's plenty of people willing to push beyond that Uh, but you have to recognize that it's a possibility and I think a lot of people are kind of afraid to do so and that's not anything wrong you know live your life do what you're called to do but yeah you think it's more also like what's my safety net you know do I want to go all you know go all in you know on on this and and tour but I will say this is, and you're very active on, on YouTube, the growth of like something like YouTube. I mean, people forget the Luminaires. That's a big reason how they were discovered was yeah. YouTube. They put Hey Ho on there, and then they're like, oh, everyone's like, check this out. And even SoundCloud, Post Malone posted a song on SoundCloud, and then and boom. I mean, yeah, you know, it's a 50-50 shot, but these platforms now put you out a lot more than like 10, year, 10 12 years ago, where we were sure. just talking about how you would go to these big festivals and there's a guy in the parking lot out of his trunk with CDs and, you know, Walkman or whatever, you know, CD, have you listen to his EP, hoping that maybe you work with Kirkland Records here or you're out of town from Universal Music. But that's how it was. But you don't have to do any of that. The age of YouTube and SoundCloud, if you're persistent and you have something yeah. good to, to offer. Um, 
Is there a question there? I don't, I, I don't know. <laughs> it just kind of more. I guess it just kind of more. But I mean, yeah, no, what do you? Like but what that. do you think about that now? Do you think that going back can help the artists here in Dallas? Because obviously we have like platforms like Deep Home Arts Festival and that, but you know, you still don't see like like it's been a while since we had a like a, a toadies come out of here <laughs> you know which yeah truly i don't know i wouldn't say that i know of a breakout dallas yeah. band in the last 10 years and maybe i'm like uninformed i don't know yeah but yeah i don't see yeah i don't see that um but I am definitely, as you said, trying to be active on YouTube, trying to be active on these platforms because I finally, it took me forever to see the value in them. Uh, And it also, I felt like I didn't start early enough and I was like, oh, these are going to be outdated soon. But you definitely, like YouTube, Instagram, they're only growing their ways in which they reach yeah. people and yeah it's about persistence it's about having good content um and i like the online community uh, we already all exist there and if that's a way that you can genuinely connect with people um yeah i think it's a great medium and i think it's uh does more for people that are serious but it also does the same thing create people that are like oh i want to do this thing and then a year later they're like oh i'm not famous yet yeah like and i think it's just like anything else like if you're trying to grow your audience in this dallas scene you're not going to do it in a year if you're going to try and grow your audience on youtube like it's gonna take some time but it is there yeah uh i spend a lot of time listening to a uh, podcast with content creators or uh, listening to other people talk about their starts on those platforms. And uh, yeah, it's only encouraged me to make that a part of what I do. Um, first and foremost, the songwriting is the most important thing to me, but uh, second to actually being in the midst of writing is yeah the online community that i'm trying to generate well speaking of songwriting i know you're working on a new album right now first how's that going and do you have like a timeline that you're trying or are you just taking it as it goes so it's done so it's done now we've tracked it so i don't want to say done like it's not complete it's almost but we there. went in the studio we live tracked it in three days wow. full band we got all 10 songs it went really well, but it was, like, tough as fuck. Like, yeah. For real. Um, there were moments on day two. Day two of three was, like, our get the songs this day because the third day we were going to be moving into the smaller uh, studio for overdubs and stuff. Yeah. And so we weren't going to have the full band, the acoustics of the main room. Like, we weren't going to have all that. So... There were moments on day two, last hour, where yeah. they're like, all right, thir- <laughs> 30 minutes. Like, you've got 30 minutes. Yeah. And it turns out we had already gotten the takes, but I also didn't feel like we yeah. had gotten the takes yet. So, yeah, we're all there. Like, I was getting stressed a little bit. And for the most part, it was a very non-stressful environment. Yeah. And everyone worked really hard and was, like, committed to the project. But, yeah, it had those moments where I was like, fuck, yeah. this is falling apart. Like, oh, no, we're not going to have anything. Yeah. Uh, but it was a great experience. We tracked at Luminous Sound here in Dallas. Uh, one, of, one of its only remaining kinds of studios because it is the classic massive control console big studio uh great acoustics like it in the digital age of home studios and albums that are great record out of a bedroom you don't see bands that are willing to go in the studio and be like one the money that comes with 
yeah. taking the time in a studio like that and then two the commitment to I'm gonna know my parts and I'm gonna play them as if you were here listening to this now cause you know you can record and you can alright that's your guitar part for that yeah. verse stop and then punch in for the next and like you can get it perfect this album will not be perfect yeah. but it has a lot of heart it has like a lot of like a lot of genuine creativity in the time frame uh, but yeah I'm super excited about it I got a mix of one of the tracks last night the, my producer Christopher Hughes he sent it to me uh, which is super cool because we just finished last Friday so yeah. a week later he already had a first mix for me and again that's one song yeah. but um, but it got you pretty it's pretty pumped too. it got me pumped yeah. and it also wasn't like if I were to choose what song I would have gotten yeah. to her first yeah. from the tracking it wouldn't have been that one yeah. only because that one's more of like a mood track like uh-huh. It has some good lyrics, but it's not like the gem of the album to yeah. me. There's a lot more songs that I'm emotionally invested yeah. in, uh, and they're a little bit more dynamic. But this is a great song to like hear the tones again because it has a lot of space. It breathes really well, and like it was also one of the ones. As I said, we didn't go in with an exact thing. I wanted people to bring what they had to the table. This song, in my mind, I was like, oh, I'm going to take out the second verse. I'm going to do it this way. I'm going to do it that way. And it's going to be like three minutes. I thought it would be a short, sweet thing. It's six minutes. And that just came from me feeling it. Like As we're all playing, I'm going to be like, I'm going to sing this here. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to keep doing this. Like, And just rolling with how we're feeling and that's a very good representation of the freedom I think that we used in the studio space well talk about like your 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 approach to when writing and creating content do you have the instrumental first before the lyric or is it hey this lyric popped in I'm gonna see where I go with this um it's generally a lyrical basis like I'm probably my song structure and chording is not intricate enough to like write like a chord hook and be like, oh, I've got to write lyrics to yeah. this. I am only ever simultaneously doing the two. Yeah. Because um, that's how I personally attach to them and like emotionally invest myself yeah. is that first line. I'm like, ooh, that was good. Like, yeah. I'm feeling something and I'll keep writing on it. Um, it is a very rare occasion that I uh, would have a chord progression I'll have maybe I wouldn't even say that I write riffs but I would have maybe occasionally like a little bit of spark on a guitar part but if I have a spark I'm gonna start singing like it's not gonna be like alright let's write out the chorus first bridge to this piece it's going to be like, let's emotionally direct the song based on what I'm singing. Because um, I think that, I think my lyrical content, my voice are my strongest, like, assets to me as an artist. Uh, my guitar playing is just a second. <laughs> got, we got to, we got a dance we got, right a, we got a distraction in the mid. We go, but it's cool. <laughs> We got a fan. Uh, so, but, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think... Uh, yeah, I think my guitar playing comes second. And yeah. uh, it's actually kind of starting to get to the point where it comes yeah. as a joint force. Yeah. But I've never really been a good guitar player. Uh, even when I was first learning the guitar, I was learning so that I could write and yeah. sing. Uh, but it's finally kind of wrapped back around where I'm super comfortable with yeah. my lyrics and my uh, melodies enough 
where I could take a little time to focus on the guitar part, it's not going to detract me from getting the essence of the song out. Where I used to think that I'd, like, I'd start like trying to fiddle with the guitar and I'd forget what I was yeah. singing before, and I'm like, "Fuck, I've forgotten this part." Like, but now I'm super comfortable with the best case scenario with the lyrics. I'm always going to know where I stand on that yeah. point. I also want to talk. You know, you have this background in comedy as as well. Uh, what was the more nerve-wracking experience? Your first time taking the stage as a solo artist? This is an or, easy oh, answer. Oh, open mic night. Easy yeah. answer. Comedy for comedy. sure. Um, there's something about music that even shitty music people, people respect. Yeah. But there's something about comedy that if you suck, people hate you. Uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, because comedy is a much, a much different sort I have of... Just, we got friends. Yeah, yeah we got friends. friends. We're popular here. Hopefully, they, wanna... they listen to the podcast. Yeah, yeah. Um, not just dance. And listen to Derek's music. Um, comedy for sure, because when you go on stage, especially for the first time, you don't know if anything works. Yeah. Now a song, you have a better perspective of how that is to you. Yeah. And regardless of your audience, you can still feel like you did a good job with that song because you know what your voice yeah. is supposed to sound like. You know if you're playing the right chords. You go on stage with comedy, even if you're nailing what you wrote down as that joke, if it's not hitting, yeah. it's not a good joke. Yeah. Like that's just how it works. Yeah. Um, and oh, a little Dallas. Uh, Shout out or a cool little Dallas moment for me. My first time ever going on yeah. at Hyenas Mockingbird Station. Uh, right after me, I brought up former Dallas Cowboy Demarcus Ware. Wow. Yeah, he was there with a friend. Yeah. His friend was doing comedy. He sucked, but went on like hours before me. But they stayed around drinking and hanging out. Yeah. And eventually, his friend uh, convinced him to go put his name down. And when you're going on late night at a comedy club, yeah. you no longer have a host. So you do what uh, is called know who you bring up. Yeah. So you're part of your set is at the end, you've already got the next name of the guy on the list and you say, all right, that's my time. And after me is, yeah. but for me it was, and check it out. Yeah. I'm bringing up the Marcus Ware. Yeah. Yeah. And Which he's is pretty up. epic. Dude, it was cool. I mean, that's, Moments like that in comedy, as much as my set wasn't anything to remember, I will always remember that. I think I recognized that comedy was a possibility yeah. for me early on, but I wasn't ever drawn to the, to the stage yeah. in that way. Yeah. Even in my first bands, I remember being the guy between songs that would always talk. Uh, I wasn't even the lead singer, but I would make jokes or I would intro the next song. And people would always laugh. Like, there would be s something about yeah. my presence that I could get a laugh out of the audience. And, um, I mean, I grew up in the early days of YouTube, so yeah. you'd start to see, like, dudes doing YouTube skits that were getting a million plays, yeah. and you're like, whoa, what the hell is happening? Yeah. Like, what is this? Uh, so, still in high school I had friends uh, where we would make little videos and nothing ever great or really we didn't know how to write comedy at the time uh, I think one of my fir first early introductions when people ask me this question I always tell the story of me quoting the Goonies the oh, movie yeah. I used to do full scenes from that really? for my friends and they would uh, be like dude do the scene for blah 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 and um, that was fun for me, but yeah. I never thought, oh, I want to act or, oh, I want to be on stage doing comedy. I would say I had been a musician for probably six years and really putting time into it before I ever thought, actually, before I ever even knew that open mics yeah. for comedy existed. Yeah. Um, I had watched a few stand-up specials. I had seen Seinfeld, so I knew that people were going on stage telling jokes, but I didn't know how to do it. Yeah. And then I was like, oh, it's kind of like music. There's open mics. You can just go yeah. sign up and people will let you try out this thing. Um, 
And after I did the first one, I was pretty hooked. I loved the idea of it. I made a lot of friends doing it. I've even done some really cool shows. Like, I've done stuff, uh, Dallas, Fort Worth, Denton, Austin, Houston, Orlando, Denver, San Francisco. Like, I've been to quite a few stages, and I like it. And I do see myself, maybe in the future, like, really putting some time into it. Yeah. Um, but right now, it doesn't... It's not really my focus. I mean, I'm always in the mindset, like, yeah. if something happens or if I have a thought, I'll jot it down as a stand-up idea. But I'm not really hitting stages the way I used to. Yeah. There was probably a good three years there where I wouldn't go a week without at least doing a set. And then there was probably a good year in those three or four years where I was going up three, four, or five times a week even. Yeah. Um, but that's a grind, dude. And I respect tons of Dallas comics, but it's just not for me right now. Yeah, full music. Uh, yeah, I'm for the music, and I realized how it detracted a little bit from my focus on music in the past. As much as I love being funny, I don't think I'm called to it the way I'm called to, to, be, to sing. Yeah. Um, but I respect it as a craft. I'm so happy that I ever did it. Um, it has made me a better writer. Yeah. Uh, and I do must see myself, maybe not as a stand-up, but like I would, I would apply to some uh, writing positions, yeah. whether that's for a Netflix show or an actual network or even just in like local produced stuff. Yeah. I could see myself succeeding in a writer's room. Because yeah. uh, I really, especially with comedy, I feed off other people really well, yeah. uh, and I enjoy it. Well, Derek, I want to thank you for your time. Yeah, it's been fun. Are we wrapping up. We are wrapping up. Cool. Now, uh, another back three <laughs> break to go. No, but I want to thank you. Uh, first, where can people find you? Yeah, yeah, totally good. I was about to say you better not wrap up without. Yeah, that. yeah, That's yeah. That's the whole yeah. reason I'm here. Yeah. No. Like, <laughs> uh, so. Uh, Instagram, Facebook are my two primary like posting platforms. Yeah. You can find me at D Tussing, which is D double E T U S I N G. Uh, I do a fair amount of stuff there. Uh, if you're really feeling me, you can roll over to my Patreon page and subscribe, uh, and that's just Patreon.com/slash Derek Tussing. Uh, and then you can find right now one studio album on streaming platforms also just at Derek Tussing uh, and then shortly in this year in the next few months uh, I'll have my next record Driving to the Game I'll have it out on all streaming platforms as well as the same producer from that record is doing a remix and remastered version of my very first self-produced album. Oh, nice. So shortly I'm going to have a three album discography that I can't wait for that yeah. to be when people find me. They're yeah. like, oh, nice. I could listen to this dude for the next three hours. Like, I'm really excited about that. So, yeah. Um, definitely, if you just, if you go to any of those, just go to my Instagram and at that point you'll find links. Oh, I didn't even mention YouTube. 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 I mean, yeah. Slash. Uh, oh, I don't have a custom URL yeah. yet. But if uh, 43 of you want to follow me and subscribe to me on YouTube, I could get that custom yeah. URL. But uh, right now, if you just search Derek Tussing on YouTube, yeah. I'm the first that'll come up. And you'll find music videos. You'll find covers. Uh, I actually just uh, hid all of my comedy because I'm trying to just do focus on music. Yeah. But in the future, you'll also find some comedy skits, yeah. some live performances. But yeah, Derek Tussing pretty much across the board. If you just Google me, you'll see my mugshot. There you uh, go. No. <laughs> there you go. And, and, and if you listen to Joe Rogan, he'll put that mugshot on the back of his wall if you become famous. <laughs> Dude, you know... Uh, mug shots are the least 
uh, presentable that most people find themselves. It's I mean, really, you never know, rarely see anyone like, hey. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. you might. I think there are a few, but I don't think that's your finest, like. Yeah, no, it's no one's finest. It's hour. not going to be your LinkedIn photo, it shouldn't <laughs> be, but it could be. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, uh, you're not going in, you're like, hey, you know, this is Bumble, you know, this yeah, is my shot, so. But yeah, hey, it's been a pleasure as hey, well. Hey, yeah, perfect. I think we did almost like an hour. <laughs>